Hi, welcome to the CIDCI online salon series. I'm Margie O'Driscoll, and on behalf of the CIDCI Board of Directors, I'd like to welcome you here today. CIDCI's mission is to accelerate innovation, disruption, and change to improve the built environment. We create networks that share knowledge, experience, and ideas through productive dialogue. CIDCI is a not-for-profit organization that relies on your financial support to provide these programs. Thank you to our sponsors who make all of this possible. Between Black History Month, Lunar New Year, Valentine's Day, President's Day, Mardi Gras, Day, uh, Mardi Gras Ash Wednesday, or yesterday's National Drink Wine Day, uh, we hope you found some time for reflection, love, joy, and whatever you needed over the last week. From these most historic times, there have been and will continue to be opportunities for change and innovation, not just in how we make things, but also how we work together. Our hope is that through this tumult, we can rise together to make a better built world, more equitable, efficient, sustainable, and beautiful. Now more than ever, please mask up, wash your hands, and stay home. Be kind and take care of, the, take care of yourself and those around you. Here's a bit of information about how today's session will work. We're recording this presentation and we'll place it on the CIDCI website as soon as possible. You'll be able to share that link with others. If you have questions or comments during the presentation, please use the chat box. We'll take as many questions as we can. And today's session will last about 60 minutes. Today's presentation is entitled Design for Freedom, the new movement to remove slavery in the building materials supply chain. Our presenter is Sharon Prince, the CEO and founder of Grace Farms Foundation. Its stake in the ground is to end modern slavery and gender-based violence and create more grace and peace in our local and global communities. In 2017, Sharon and the late Bill Menking, a, a longtime friend of mine, who was the founding editor of the Architects newspaper, began a conversation about forced labor in the building materials supply chain and what could be done to eliminate it. It is horrifying to note that globally, almost 25 million people are held in servitude for forced labor and close to 152 million children from the ages of five to 17 are subjected to child labor. I'll pause here and just let you think about the enormity of that. Sharon, Bill, and a working group of design leaders came together to create a report that they called Design for Freedom. The report presents a call to action, including the development of slave-free specifications and rigorous auditing standards in the procurement of construction materials, as well as the use of big data and technology to dismantle illegal dependence on slave labor. The report also lays out an ethical business model to reduce reputational risks and increase long-term gains. Sharon's going to discuss the report and what we as the design and construction industry can do to address this issue. Sharon, thank you for joining us and for the work you've done to date. Thank you for, thank you for having me here today. Let's see, I am going to share a first, a, a first we'll talk to about, this is Grace Farms. Many of you, um, I know you're on the east, on the west coast, but here we are on the east coast. And as you described, uh, Margie, we're, we are tackling humanitarian issues that are, are pretty difficult, but we are bringing together the uh, public, private, and government sectors. So you can see in this design, it's meant to be an open, transparent space that also allows for a hopeful, <laughs> a hopeful outcome. We're dealing with such dark issues as modern day slavery. And so Design for Freedom is this new movement that, um, that we, are, we just initiate, initialized a few months ago. So you're all, I'd love for you all to be able to you, think through how um, your own wherewithal can contribute to the movement. And as we go through this, uh, as I start to share the subject matter and, and also uh, touch points and intervention points that you can apply your own wherewithal, please um, bring those forward and we you know, ask you to really add human, human rights and uh, as a fundamental criterion in the building material specification and procurement and envision your buildings being built slave free and you know, without embedded slavery in your foundations, your facades, your curtain walls, and that simply does not exist in today's global economy. 
So one thing I do know is that you all are innovators and you're well aware that the built environment has a relationship with nature and people and thinking, you know, building on many you know, decades of sustainable work and also thinking through how now to, to uh, you know, to really be able to work on embedded carbon as well. But there was one, you know, one question that, um, that I realized was uh, presented a, this next question that there's a blind, uh, really significant blind spot in the sector. The question is, is your building ethically sourced as well as slave free? And, um, I mean, and as well as sustainably designed? So the answer is, you know, no, there's really, it does not exist, but there are global laws that forbid the use of slave labor in the built environment and we um, that really are reliant on slave labor. The, the buildings are, uh, I'll just explain to all the, the uh, materials that are at risk. Mm -hmm. So this radical paradigm shift to remove slavery from the building material supply chain is really about reforming an entire industry. And is one um, that I'd like for you to see, uh, you can hear from Chris Sharple as part of our working group. And, um, as well, and but before we do, as it was, we're going to um, really tell you what we're doing is we're illuminating the the permanent imprint of slavery in the building materials supply chain, and that's different than other sectors that have already been wrestling with this and working on uh, moving their industries more towards an ethical supply chain like textiles and um, agriculture. Those are you could have a cup of coffee today that is, um, you can make that choice for tomorrow that would be slave free. With the, with the built environment, if there's a permanent imprint, you cannot go back. And um, nevertheless, the, the harm to humanity exists in both cases. So we're creating this radical paradigm shift by uh, working on awareness, institutional responses, laws, policies, and standards. And um, this is Chris Sharples. And I would like, he's part of the working group we operate in an industry that is not innovating. So the business model is broken. People are spending a great deal of money trying to build buildings and it's incredibly wasteful, incredibly inefficient. And so one of the ways that they deal with it in order to keep costs down is they look for cheaper ways of doing things, cheaper materials. And in a lot of cases that is because the labor that is being utilized to make those materials is actually slave labor. So um, you may know, you know, he's one of the most, he's so innovative and um, you know, thinking about sustainability from um, you know, many vantage points and in interjecting digital, digitalization modeling, um, pretty incredible, but he's also He's part of our working group, group trying to tackle figuring out how do we add labor inputs into that new technology. And, um, and so the first question too is, okay, is, 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 is like thinking about slavery. And he had to ask this question too, uh, along with most everybody in the working group that um, did not understand that there was even slavery in the supply chain, much less their role. So first I wanna go over the sla slavery itself, how it is an elite, it's illegal in every country, but co countries are moving towards making corporations more accountable. You know about the UK Modern Slavery Act of 2015 that, but however, the one that's, you're there you are in California, many of you, um, but the first act that came into play was the California Supply Chain Transparency Act that I'll go through in a, in a minute, but one that has the most teeth is the US Trade Facilitation and Enforcement Act, TIFTIA. That is teeth and because it disallows all products made with slave labor from entry into the United States. So we, when we, um, we look at the California uh, Transparency Act to give you a little more, uh, put a little more meat on the bones there and just see, how, I'd like to also even learn if you've changed over the last decade, any of your, you know, how you've changed into being compliance, but for those companies that do have gross receipts over 10 million, 100 million, it's a high number. So um, we wanna see also like the cascading effects of this, of this law, how that, how that really affects um, other suppliers in the whole um, supply chain. But you can see that they um, are required to conduct audits, um, to evaluate uh, supplier compliance. 
and also to maintain um, internal accountability, provide training to company employees and management. So that was that's one act that started the um, you know the others that had came thereafter. So not only is forced labor produced goods um, prohibited, but also illegal logging of timber, and that's through the Lacey Act. So at the board, this is at the board of, Cal of um, the United States, and many of you are working on global global projects. But this all affects the the full um, ecosystem and the whole the, the whole supply chain when the products are moving from country to country. So modern slavery as a, uh, there's key risk factors that absolutely apply to the construction sector. Hazardous, undesirable work, vulnerable, low-skilled, easily replaced uh, workforce, migrant workforce, long, complex, and or non-transparent product supply chains, presence of labor contractors, recruiters, agents, and other um, middle men and women in the uh, labor supply chain. So the whole industry is at risk. It is the largest and the most disaggregated industrial sector as well. So it is, um, and not only that, it's the, also the most at risk of forced labor. It's a hundred itself, the modern day slavery is 150 billion criminal industry worldwide. And, um, and also, uh, in the United States, uh, the whole sector is at 11.4 trillion. So as a large, um, as well as the 13% of the world's global, DG, uh, global uh, GDP, there's also 1.2 million people in the, sect, in the um, US construction sector as well. So you see it's a large industry the mo at, and at the most risk of slave labor. So there's 18% um, of those people are in the construction, that'd be more on the, on the job site, but then you add in manufacturing, um, wholesale and trade, forestries, logging, mining. You can see all these inputs come in from um, many sectors and they end up in the, in the buildings that we build. So we wanna address the other half of the equation. There's on-site labor that's being addressed. Um, and we'll talk about that later, later too with building welfare, there's um, the workers welfare principles. And however, the material procurement is not being addressed. It's getting a transparent, basically it's getting material pass. Um, many unchecked uh, pr products are being um, used in the buildings that we have right now. And there's so many challenges too, because we have not only is it disaggregated, there's thin margins, the supply chain is, is opaque. There's a um, lack of standards, corruption, and so forth. And so we want to go beyond the job site and extend a, an ethical lens into mining, material extraction, manufacturing, fabrication, and logistics. So the key question um, that I have been asking owners, and that means all of us, because whether you are a um, you have a corporate headquarters that is um, you know, corporate headquarters, warehouses, retail stores, um, you know, so whether you're refitting for COVID, whether you're a homeowner uh, on the retail side, are we subsidizing our ROIs with slavery? And the answer is likely yes. So that's hard to swallow, really, because like you don't want to think that your um, IRA, ROIs are being upheld and uh, you know by slavery, free force labor. So who we had to come through and figure out who influences the building supply chain. And here are seven different areas that we pulled together to acknowledge that it's not just the manufacturers and suppliers and extractors, but it's those are extracting the um, materials. But it's really all of us. There's there's the government with the wherewithal. And you see in bold are all the areas that we identify as a means to apply your wherewithal and to include labor inputs. So contracts and laws are one of, one of those areas uh, in terms of finance as well. Uh, owners that, um, and developers with the OPRs, we mandate lead certified buildings. We mandate um, uh, to be in compliance basically with laws. Uh, this is one of those laws that we need to be in compliance with and to put the, the uh, mandate into the OPRs as well. 
And then there's um, even awareness of media and, and, and activists. They're shaping culture. And it certainly has been um, started to get some traction there as well. And then with uh, construction teams, and first of all, with the, the architectural design team specifications, I'm going to go into a little more depth on that. And also on construction teams with, teams with procurement and documentation. And certainly with the manufacturers to certify, audit, and document is very important. We need the data in order to transfer that into trustable data. So in education and research, that's been, um, that, that's super important. The muscles for our research are, are pretty um, strong while they're in, in uh, universities and um, with teams. And that's starting to happen right now on this matter. So one of the early things that, um, so you'll see too, that part of the working group started many of those that worked on Grace Farms um, on our building. And so they heard me talk about it, but many, and, but many other, others have said, okay, well, well, how am I culpable? I'm an architect. I'm just right. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm drawing, I'm, you know, drawing the designs. So I'm not, I'm not procuring. However, it's very specifically um, important. This is a great quote from Florian Einberg and uh, Jane Liu that's in our report from Soul Ill. And it's worth me just highlighting a couple of these points, but we fail to realize that every line a designer or architect draws sets into motion a string of actions that have environmental, social, and ethical repercussions. Today, we cannot ignore this fact anymore. So if every line we draw affects a string of material practices with an ecological impact, it also affects a series of labor practices that impact human rights. Our designs define the labor needed to extract the material from the earth, the labor to clean it, process it, assemble it, transport it, and to build it on a construction, construction site. So the onus um, starts, you can see from that whole um, ecosystem, it, it really um, is important for all of us uh, to understand how we're affecting the whole supply chain. It does start with the pen or the, the computer now, <laughs> the computer. So now we think about, all right, so just tell me, what do, what do I need to do? Like what, what materials are the ones that have the highest risk? And so let's take a close look at what we're building with. And you can see that it's opaque because it comes from the, the products and materials come from 193 possible countries. They're traveling and circulating around the globe. Uh, the raw materials and products end up putting you know, thousands of materials into the building. So right now it's very, you know, even with lighting, you could have a thousand materials going to lighting and so forth. So it's, it's a very, um, very opaque supply chain and for many other reasons too. But at the highest risk of uh, those materials that in the building material supply chain was never, was not, there was no running list. We're early days on this. So we put together a list uh, with both Verite, so the CEO of Verite is also on our group, in our group, and a senior advisor, Lou DeBaca, who's a former ambassador of modern day slavery, and our team, we went to, pulled this, the information together, identified these 12 materials that are the highest risk, both raw materials and composite. So the raw materials go from precursor minerals, mica, uh, many others, to iron, copper, stone, timber, bricks, electronics, steel, fiber and textiles, glass and rubber. That's nearly everything, right? You think about that goes into our, our buildings. So, so the, um, the, what we wanna think about now is how do we incorporate this anti-slavery ethos into design and construction process and to really bring that on par as, what we, as we are aiming for sustainable buildings. And we wanna, and what that means, we have to put, we have to uh, create the missing standards and labor inputs, and we have to illuminate the building material supply chain to redirect these slave-free products and um, produce products. So, timber. Let's just go dive into one material. There's a timber vulnerability, absolutely. It is the second. Um, well, it's the, the most ubiquitous used material, but it's also the second, we're the second largest in the United States of timber following China. And 38% of all wood used globally is for, is, is used within the building and the construction sector. 
So the onus is on us to ask, okay, where are the, where's the timber coming from? And who's, who is um, the one that's, that's felling the wood, that's transporting it and, um, and so forth. So here is one example, rosewood, um, which is, and this is in um, Madagascar too. So Merith Gore is also part of our working group. And this is what so typically what she could see that logs are stockpiled into large piles on the beach, sometimes in the port city. There's an organized systemic well-oiled machine. Um, and you can see the devastation is also um, causing to the country at the same time. But the, the uh, legacy of slave labor lives on for generations. And um, you don't know, you would not know this. And you might know I pay wood is at risk for sustainable reasons, but it's also, and many of these tropical woods are also at risk of uh, slave labor as well. So how do they end up into our system? How do they end up into projects and buildings? Uh, there was a report that the Brooklyn Bridge was recently renovated using wood that was um, sourced and linked to slave labor. And also Lowe's, the second largest material chain in the US, sold US floor products that were, which were also linked to slave labor. So there's um, starting to be, as you know too, there's an ethical ethos generally. People do wanna know where their coffee's coming from, you know, where their, where their t-shirts and, and so forth are coming from. Next, they're gonna turn to everything that they are, that, that, the, uh, that we're purchasing and the lens is going to turn. The idea here is um, once we know, we can't unknow it. And also we want to be able to get it. it shouldn't, we shouldn't wait until there's someone being added like this, right? We need to get ahead of that um, and to, to start to uh, move the needle on this. So the nations that are producing timber at risk of forced labor and human trafficking are many. So there's 18 on this that we pulled together on this, uh, on this map that you can see that are at risk of forced labor and human trafficking. So when you look to, to do a little more deep dive into the top global producers then of construction related timber products, you see that many of these are the ones that also are at risk. And not that, uh, of course, not every product that's produced in everyone's countries is made with slave labor. It's just you need, we need to know and have a filter for those, um, you know, uh, when it comes in from these countries. So other um, woods, just woods that you would know from Brazil, Russia, and Peru that are at risk, they're in the report and you can look at those, but there are many. And then you think about mass timber, which is, you know, lauded as is a new and very important innovation uh, for the sustainable movement, but timber itself is at risk. So this is something that as we're equally paying attention to mass timber, and we have um, also Susan Jones and Michael Green, a part of our group too, thinking now about doing more research, figuring out, okay, we do need to know where our mass timber is coming from. And there's, there's so many um, ways that this can also contribute to reducing forced labor by standardization. You can see the prefab construction helps. Um, the structure lamb beams that are in um, Grace Farms, uh, they, are, they, are, they are also FSC certified wood. FSC certified wood is now just this year adding ILO uh, requirements to reduce and to address, um, not to reduce, but to ensure there's no slave labor. So that just happened this year. So um, again, and we'll talk about how to look at the um, certifications as another way to reduce slave labor. But as we're looking at other trading partners, uh, that, you know, other building materials that come into the US specifically, there are, um, in terms of crushed stone, iron ore, brick, you might think, oh, we make all the brick here in the United States. Well, we don't, we bring in, um, we bring in uh, brick as well, and it comes from other at-risk countries. And then, um, uh, something interesting too that I uh, was we were looking into this is that 98% of the U.S. imported zinc is from Peru, and Peru has um, a very high rate of forced labor in the mines of Peru for zinc particularly. So uh, when I think that I have zinc flashing at Grace Farms, you know we did not check that, not knowing this, um, you know, not knowing that this was the, the magnitude of this issue at all um, while we were building only. At only a, a few years after that. 
So zinc itself is used for rust, uh, rust, proof, rust proofing, as well as gutter, you know, for gutters, pipes, and, uh, and it really is uh, you know, in a lot of the environment, environmentally sustainable buildings. But as an example, Canada's largest zinc and copper mining company was successfully sued for forced labor in its supply chain. So uh, it's, it's, it's there. Um, brick is one of the most at used um, you know, at risk materials as well. And you think about this imagery what we put into the report is the, uh, the recognition that there is, um, you might be building a school like there is on the right. And at the same time, those bricks that we're using could be made with children um, in the, in the, uh, the um, origination of the, um, of the, supply, at the supply chain. So this is um, something that is, uh, moves all of us to be and make sure that while we're trying to do good and we're trying to create these sustainable for good um, uh, buildings and just or or or, or um, very utilitarian uh, buildings that uh, we do need and utilitarian buildings are also can be for good um, but we want to make sure that these materials are are absent of forced labor Includes steel, you can see the conditions are hazardous for many of these products. Sand that goes into our glass. And then roof, um, they think about rubber. Rubber has um, had, has been plagued with uh, forced labor for centuries and it can be in the classroom. It can be there, but also just on the tires that we use to transport materials to and from the, the job site. Textiles are found in shades and you know, carpets and and um, sewing materials within the interiors. And um, there has been progress in the textile industry. So there's more room to be able to, to at least identify textiles that have an ethical um, sieve as well. But you can see there's not only all of these products, but also when you think about jute, India and Bangladesh are the only countries in the world to produce it in commercial quantities. And we use that on every job site. So still need to know even some of the other supplies that we use on the job site as well. So environmental, environmental sustainability does not hold up with forced labor. You can see too, even when you're trying to put in a solar panel and add to the sustainable um, effect of your building, they could be the, the, the materials like polycrystalline silicon is often sourced in areas at risk, China's autonomous region and um, others. So it's really fascinating when you dig into the, the um, you know, how these composite materials like steel are made and you look at all of the steps and see there is such a risk into each one of these areas. And we go into that into the report, but I wanted to also note that not each one of the components is at risk um, individually, but it's also quite often coming from many countries at the same time. So being able to, um, tr you know, to track that is also super important. Mica, you wouldn't think about that, but it's also a high performance insulator of steel and 70% of India's mica comes from illegal hazardous mines, often by children. So this is just for fun, because I, I really do love the construction process. And, and you can see too that there are many materials here that we're describing. And because we are, we were more bespoke, uh, you know, uh, bespoke project, we could track many of our materials in a way, um, even forensically, which we, just, which we just did on this project with Siami, our construction manager. But those are the, the glue lamb beans from Structure Lamb. Um, our bricks were made by Peterson. And so they have a um, they have a, a vertical supply chain, and they are that's a, a transparent one from them. But we wanted to go ahead and figure out. Okay, now this is the roof of the of, of Grace Farms, and it's two by twenty brushed aluminum. We wanted to find out. Okay, how far can we go down the supply chain? So from you know metal screws, aluminum extrusions down to the gutter caps. And you can see that um, we couldn't get much far, definitely couldn't get to the raw material sources, but we could go you know, a, a couple um, steps down the supply chain and we could have gone a lot further. 
What we found out is that if we'd asked the questions before we, we were um, procuring and building these uh, components and putting these components together, then they would have, um, this was Zayner, they would have been very keen to help us uh, be able to create more transparency. And so there, that, that wasn't, um, you know, quite often you think, oh, this is my secret sauce. I can't give up my supply chain. And it's not so because no one's going to make this, the, the roof like they have uh, put together for, for Grace Farms that way. But it's important in terms of being able to, uh, you know, to be able to really create more transparency in the supply chain. So you can talk about like the, the give and take there. The risks are clear. There's reputational risk, legal risk, and financial risk. But there's a lot of opportunity that I want to talk about in terms of market distinction and humanitarian impact. So there's also on the finance side, um, you think about the profits being privatized, but the costs are socialized. You can see that um, there's also a greater inspection uh, from the investment community. There's, you, know, you think about ESGs and there's a greater, there's a really great emphasis on the environmental. Only 8% of the 1700 ESG um, um, uh, ESGs are even um, socially related. So 8% are socially related. That's gonna increase. And so it will increase, but right now we want to, um, and so just know that that's around the corner. It's, it's, it will be around the corner. And, um, and also, and this is something that I think is turning to, okay, what can we do? So one of the very first things you can do is also just create a material library that has that sieve for the um, you know, products made without forced labor. So that's a very pragmatic thing to do. And, uh, and it can include all these other criterion as well. This is from Ann Rowland of, of um, FX Collaborative. And she's um, moved her offices during COVID and then said, okay, this is my commitment. And so she started to create this material uh, library man um, manifesto for her team. And so um, we're encouraging everyone to do that as well. But as you think through um, even value engineering, you say, okay, I'm gonna value engineer. I know we did that for Grace Farms. It was um, partly thinking, okay, the, the cost, but also then you create a better outcome. And so uh, by reducing the cost and create a better outcome, we, we did do that in terms of the design, but quite often it's just, let's just go for lower cost, lower cost. And we do that in this sector, it's already the least modernized and very stagnant. It's very much like it was in the 1950s. It's not like many other industries have just far surpassed us. But the, so what can happen though, instead of just, um, you know, we can look to innovation and uh, to really fit, create more efficiency by more, with having more transparency in the supply chain and can reduce that exploitation at the same time. So cheap and exploitable labor does stifle the modernization um, of the industry. And there's not, and the point here is that there's like not even a need to innovate. So it keeps, it's very stagnant. If you think you don't need to innovate, then, um, you know, then, then you're not you're gonna benefit from these new technologies. And there are new technologies that are that can penetrate the supply chain. This is copper here, um, using blockchain technologies. We have Thompson Reuters on our team too, and McKinsey's AI group. And we're going to start to also, um, you know, look at more deeply on the ability and of using blockchain and other technology to do so. And then in the meantime, what we need to think about is. The, you know, create, creating this whole new future state, um, we need that not only technology change, but process um, evolution <clears throat> and an industry culture shift. So this tr trustable data is key because without the data, without documenting the supply chain, without having um, this, um, you know, the tools that we can apply, I know that it's, um, it's gonna be a longer ways away. When we think about the BIM system, there's, there's no specifications that are in the BIM system at this time, even something simple like that. Um, now, we think about the industry itself is, you know, is what we know now is that it is ripe for, for disruption. There's a one, it's right now at 1% uh, productivity rate, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, we are there just over the last seven years or so, the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, 
take one quick sip. <laughs> we have a, um, there's been increase in R&D spending, which is important to note, and also an increase in permanent modular construction, which affords a way to have uh, standardization as well. So that's, um, that is promising. And then when there's a, there's a McKinsey study that was done recently, it was done um, mid-year last year. And I think this is an important one to note because it shows that this is a study from 400 top construction executives, and they're looking at um, new product production technology as one of those emerging disruptions, digital, digital um, that will have an impact, the, the disruptions that will have an impact. Uh, so that'd be new production technology, digitalization of products. You can see how product centric this is. <clears throat> new materials technology. So you can see it's very product oriented, which I'm, I'm glad to see. And I think this is where we come, come in with an opportunity to leverage the um, focus on new, on new pr product technology and to add those labor inputs. And the other thing that's interesting is going to happen within the next five years is what their expectation is. You can see the top of the list where those probable shifts, sustainability still at the top. Uh, you can look down, <clears throat> you don't see ethical supply chains at all. It's not even on the list, not in view. Nobody's view, just you should know that too. We're in a very nascent stage here. Um, but, there's, but what's exciting too, is that the future industry dynamics will put product-based approaches very, um, very much in the fore. And, um, and I think that's where we have this um, you know, new materials, have this, this um, ability to move the needle on, on um, ethical supply chains. So well, this is one of Chris's projects in the Botswana Innovation Hub. What I just wanted to share here is that there's, he's thinking I, how he can use his own you know, digital modeling and visualization technologies he did developed in house for this project. How can he then apply the labor inputs here? And um, he's also looking at other industries, Boeing that, has, that has a, also has a very, um, you know, thousands of inputs and a pretty disaggregated um, supply chain as well. So that's exciting. But as we're thinking of new innovative, this is what you do, think of innovative technologies and new kinds of structures. This is just an example of how we were thinking through Grace Farms, but it's exciting to think about that. But what I want you to think about now is how you can innovatively think about creating slave-free buildings at, alongside of all this new innovation. I think there's, that's the, that's what we're hoping for. So design for freedom is what we initialized just and, and launched just back in October that I hope you'll become a part of. Uh, the, the report that Marjorie was describing is, is, uh, includes inputs from 40 of our working group members and uh, gives you a baseline understanding of the issue and a little more in depth. We have a website to go through that helps to navigate and um, really has an ability for more of a you know, ability to take action, ways to do that. And then we have a visible expression of the movement and face mask that we um, put together with architects and so forth to demonstrate also how you can um, create that ethical supply chain. We did that, made this ethical mask. These are folks, these are uh, firms that are all part of the working group, many you likely know. Uh, Herman Miller, I highlight here because they partnered with, with us to distribute these masks so that we could um, show this sign of solidarity, but also to be able to support the movement. And um, when you're building a building, it's a long process. There's a lot, you can't do something sometimes like that. Um, we do want pro pilot projects, but this is one that Herman Miller has committed to and has, is starting to work with us on. Here's um, the there's a means for you to look at the website. And then this is, we have Herman Miller, and you know, the Eames chairs are in the library. Here's a library and part of our working group that we have at Grace Farms. But these masks were um, created as with inspiration from the roof. And here's the mask. It is, um, was, it was made in Puerto Rico. And I can tell you how, show you a little bit how it's made, but what it does, it represents these complex raw material supply chains. So we had to do that. It took us five months 
to do that, um, that you as architects, engineers, construction industry, uh, and owners navigate at scale. So uh, Shohei Yoshida from SANA, he, um, and along with Peter Miller, who is from Handel, these are both our project architects at Grace Farms. And they, um, they we asked them and they did this pro bono for us. So they uh, put together um, and, and figure out how to create this exterior shell, it's using this Japanese 1300 year old um, uh, fabrication. And um, you can see all these materials come from all over and we had to create this exercise so it can be, know that it can be done. And it was uh, important. So now we're starting the movement to, starting to spread. So we've got, we're starting to get coverage. And um, in Fast Company, it was important to say this is a business case for ethical supply chains, of course. And then um, now, so here's another thing. What do you, you know, what do you do now? The number one thing you can do is to ask, ask suppliers for codes of conducts and to verify labor inputs of the material or product. And then here are a number of things that we also have those in the report, but there's some very um, you know, basic things, I'll go back to that, um, that you can do. Know the laws like you were describing, educate your organizations that we're doing lunch and learns, um, draw as well in, in, within companies to help bring the issue to the fore draw attention of industry leaders, which we're doing, and um, putting ethical sourcing statements on your own website, create strategic plans, audit your current supply chains, and address complaints. Not so easy, but we can talk about how to, you know, if you haven't been doing that, to show as, you know, how to do it. You can also, um, and I'll move this up, let's see. Um, and then you can also, there's also something interesting, like Houston had a mandate for zero tolerance for human trafficking and city service contracts and purchasing. City funds you know, should not be used to promote human trafficking in any manner. So if you see something like this, we can like say, okay, now if you're gonna build a building, then it certainly needs to be in compliance with your own laws. And so, like, so I think that's important to uh, recognize. So working with the Construction Specifi uh, Specifications Institute and specifier um, Bill Dubois at Gensler, wanted to really dig into even specifications. Okay, so now you have these three areas that you're responsible for to, to put together the specifications documents and how that goes into um, product, to the uh, procurement. So one thing that is clear is that there's owner's requirements, but even if the owner doesn't require that there's that um, a slave-free building, you can still, um, still the onus is on you now, to, since you know, uh, to ensure that the client does know that there is uh, a need for ethical compliance, that no products can come into the country without forced labor. And we already have um, global laws that disallow forced labor. Um, certainly want to make sure that the, pro the projects are not upheld um, and have forced labor in them. But you can do that by just acknowledging the legal <laughs> compliance. Mm -hmm. And then also within the quality of the products, there's ethical certifications and standards that can reduce the, the, um, the amount of uh, forced labor in the supply chain. And of course, for execution, documentation is super important. And these are the building uh, responsibly worker welfare principles, uh, the building responsibly, um, the group that started with the largest uh, construction firms, uh, Bechtel, Floor, Jacobs, and so forth. And it took them four years really to come up with these nine that they agreed upon. Because what that does is level the playing field for all abiding by these worker welfare principles. So what happens, and as we talk about the realities of pulling this all together, you can say, well, if I, I I'm going to be less competitive, perhaps if I don't, um, if I now have to add an audit to my, you know, to 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 my project and so forth. So this is where the industry needs to be working together so we can reestablish the market price at the reality of it, what it should be without forced labor. And there's current certifications and reporting mechanisms that are, we have at the back of the report, there's about 30 that do have uh, third-party audits as part of their certifications or standards. And here's just a list on timber alone. So you can take a look at that. It still does, there's still not the be all end all because it's a dynamic process, um, you know, auditing process, but it does certainly help to reduce. So now we're in the um, just ways to engage we we're doing, we've done webinar series with Pratt Institute, NYU's um, Stern Business School, Business Schools, Architecture Schools. 
We also announced a USGBC partnership with Mahesh, who's a CEO, and we're working on how to add those, um, you know, how to uphold their idea of having social equity be one of the main things they're thinking about when we discuss this, like, absolutely, we can't have social sustainability, you know, we can't have social equity without having a force, um, and without having a slave rebuilding. So we also, um, Yale had the first, we helped to sponsor, uh, support the first class, dedicated studio, and that's um, a seminar class uh, at Yale with uh, Phil Bernstein and Lou DeBaca that just finished. And we have between corporations and even local. So here's a number of the academic engagements. So thinking through if you're, a, if you're associated with, an inst with a um, university, this is a means to bring in the subject matter into the classroom. So these are the number of ones that we've done um, starting with uh, almost uh, two years ago as well. And so the other, um, I talked about the, the um, ones that are upcoming is Cornell next week. And so then there's pilot projects that can come out of that. That's what we need as well. We need pilot projects. And if you're working on an upcoming project, this is the way to be able to not only be in compliance, particularly if it's a government project, because there's already government procurement laws as well. And, um, but certainly it allows us to be able to take part of a project and do the, the supply chain work that's necessary. And we're eager to help on that as well. So as a wrap up, uh, you all know, and I hope that um, you know, now that you uh, will you know, realize there's a duty to act and ensure that we're using our corporate and in industry expertise to do something that's that's not being done and um, is, is, is a real, is a significant blind spot in our in industry to help people. So at that, I'll turn it over to you, Maggie. Sharon, thank you so much. Uh, there's so much here, so very much to unpack. Maybe you could um, stop sharing screen and yeah. um, we could. Uh... <clears throat> yeah, did that work? Yeah, that's perfect. Um, I, I was uh, wondering a bit about how you started this journey. It's obviously really emotionally a difficult one to even imagine that that slavery is really going on. And I'm curious about how you how you became interested in this topic, um, and wanted to really pursue it both from your experience at Grace Farms as well as personally. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's a good question. Um, so I learned about um, our day slavery in the early 2000s, but it's mainly uh, really as it relates to sex trafficking. And so it's just was, it was just dumbfounding to me that it could be existing. This is early days uh, and existing for thousands of years, of course, but it's just, it didn't seem possible. So what I saw though, over time is that it was entropic, that just, it, there was no pushback. There's like no finger in the dike, nobody, really doing anything. And then the more you learn, you realize, okay, that expands beyond sex trafficking, forced labor. There's, um, there's 30, there's like 30 different you know, types of, of modern day slavery from, uh, for, you know, forced marriages to indentured servitude. There's, there's many different, uh, types of slavery that, that comprises modern day slavery. So when, with the idea was to create Grace Farms as a generative platform to, Bring to, like over time, they would just compound when you have, it, it, was, it, was, it was something that as bringing together, bringing people in pro, into proximity with this issue, um, as well as just to be in proximity to just you know, many others. But particularly the idea is, was to be able to um, create these new outcomes. And I did not think that, okay, by building Grace Farms, it does make sense now, but it's like we were building Grace Farms. So I had this investment in architecture and what architecture could do because that was the inspiration behind it was that space communicates. You know, and it's like, wow, that's a very interesting concept. Space can, can communicate, whereas for over a hundred years, you know, not just in a minute, like now, you know, it's like this space should communicate, can, if it can communicate something that would last and that could be generative, that's pretty phenomenal. And that's why we created Grace Farms. So then to now then see what happened is that is in the, by the increased level of understanding of, of the forced labor issue, 
And then in, what happened, I was on the AIA um, national jury to evaluate projects. And I could see that, the, that, and we had already submitted before too. And I understood, yes, sustainability was a high, was very highly weighted. But then I realized, oh, there's, when I asked, well, we're gonna evaluate a project. Do we know if this project has, uh, that is mainly made with bricks, slave free? And nobody could, I realized, oh no, no, no one knows this. And so that's how it came together. Mm -hmm. It's really by being in proximity, it's by not being so isolated that these issues then can start to come together, right? So, mm -hmm. so we have another question here from Forrest uh, Peterson at Stanford. Um, could you speak on domestic labor slavery? There was a recent case in downtown San Jose that resulted in a criminal conviction in prison. However, there's not been a strong response to increase enforcement. If we can't pre prevent slavery next to Stanford University, as best I can tell, mm -hmm. um, I'm the only academic yeah. working in this domain at Stanford. How do we expect to have an impact anywhere else? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's absolutely happening in the United States as well. Uh, and so the, and it, there's cases that definitely are here in the United States. At Grace Farms, our head of justice initiative is a former, uh, we have law enforcement on our team. So we do trainings. We have, um, so we've had, we held a custom, um, customs border protection convening where we talk all about, um, you know, really training people on slavery. Uh, so it's training. We need like, there's more training needing for law enforcement. It's, it's starting to happen, but it needs, needs more. And, um, and we're not gonna get to everybody immediately, right? So we need to, then that's why I really believe that the, um, the power, the corporate power, the, the power of our purchasing, you know, dollars and, and yen and everything else is, is really significant. And that's why I'm really keen on addressing it um, with the corporate sector in this way. Mm -hmm. I think the, the other thing that um, really intrigued me about the work that you've done and how important it is for the industry is about 10 years ago uh, during the con uh, reconstruction of San Francisco's Bay Bridge, um, there was a, a case of um, slave labor being used uh, to do some of the um, work on welding some of the bolts on the bridge. Um, and I, I, I couldn't believe this was happening in the Bay Area. You know, we, we have this idea of the Bay Area as being this bastion of liberalism and mm -hmm. we really care about people. And so I was really interested in how did this happen? And essentially what happened, it was subcontractors to subcontractors to subcontractors, right. you know, so it was so far down the line that nobody, nobody could sort of take responsibility. And I think that ultimately what, what you're asking of the industry is for everyone to put sort of a stake in the sand, if you will, and say, we, we all have a responsibility at some point, and it's really easy to just go, you know, hey, not my job, I don't have to get involved, but the only way that this incredible travesty is going to change is by each of us individually saying, okay, what can I do to impact this situation? And, you know, we have many leaders on this call um, who can actually say, hey, my company's going to actually step forward. This is something that's really important. But no matter where you sit within your organization, there are things that you can do to publicize this issue and talk about it, no matter how very painful and, and really horrifying uh, it, it is to think about. I mean, I, I think I, I'm so in awe of you, Sharon, of sort of stepping forward in something that is so horrifying every day to begin to continue this dialogue. That's so difficult, but something that we all need to find strength within ourselves to, to actually step forward and, and do. I, I appreciate that too, that, that another um, example. So there are examples of this. But the suffering is is real for these. It's it's, it's, it's real. It, the reality is there is suffering, and it's and it's just it, there's no if there's if nobody's taking if we're going to keep you know, moving <laughs> around and not taking responsibility, then it it does continue. I mean, it's just incredible that that there's that there's there's really um, you know, no stopping it unless everybody says this is not acceptable, and and I do believe it will happen though because. The ethical ethos is, you know, right now we're in historic times. People realize, okay, they even understand a little more about supply chains because, wow, we didn't have PPE, you know, um, and then that's something actually worked on. And, and we brought in 2 million PPE um, at Grace Farms. We turned our, right now we're closed. So if you're going to come, we're closed, Bell, we're, we're closed now, but working on humanitarian, uh, as, as a humanitarian distribution center. But people now understand supply chains do, okay, there is, there is something, um, and even the, the, 
the uh, rubber gloves were held up at with an WRO with withholding release order too. So it's starting. And so if you're you have leaders here on this call, it I tell you what, this is where you know you can lead before there's an infraction, right? That comes that's going to end up um, at your door. Or you can also you know to activate your companies. Um, this is where um, many of the you know of the younger generation also and this is what they care about this is the kind of company they want to be involved in and to be an innovator in technology and to you know new ways of doing things this is is about as important as it gets in terms of innovation mm -hmm. um I, I also want to give you a chance to pitch that most handsome mask um, <laughs> and ask yeah. um if people are interested in uh boosting their masking capacity um where would they where, where how do they purchase that that mask oh that's great thank you so much for that it's on um, herman miller's website and you can go just to herman miller um and actually if you go to designforfreedom.org at the on the home page at the bottom it's right there and if you sign up for our newsletter too this is something that we just put out a newsletter yesterday um that, that talked about uh, speaking here today as well. Brilliant. So um, so that every, so the more that people understand there's ways to engage um, and that, that also has the, the mask, the ability to buy the mask as well. But that it gives, it, it's such a, it's really a well-fitting, it's a beautiful mask and people do ask about it. And then you can, you know, it's a good way to um, share the issue as well, as well as support it. So and, and hopefully it's a bit of a fundraiser for all your really terrific work yeah. as well. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, and also for companies. Um, so you have companies that are buying it also in bulk, and um, and also all of the Heron Miller and Sign Within Reach um, uh, a staff who's at the stores are wearing the masks and selling them as well there. So uh, so it's it's really it's an incredible thing. They it's for Heron Miller to step up and do this. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I'm going to ask if you have a final last word, and then I, I'm going to close us out. So. Um... Any any last words? Well, I, I first of all, I, I'd love for um, I, I haven't seen the chats either, so I'll take a look at the chats later. But um, but please, and Michelle or, or Elizabeth, you can just put my email address up there too. Or I, I'm happy to field anything. This is all new for most of you, and as it turns out, there's always really great ideas of how to apply what you do, whether it be a, a project that's coming up a um you know an opportunity to share this a little wider uh you know, just be, because it, it does take uh you know it takes all of us to be able to to do this well and there's many more ideas i believe to come so i really welcome them and um and i do think that um you've got a great leader margie so thank you for 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 bringing this to everyone's attention i know it's a new type of subject matter and and i i, I Appreciate you you raising the um, the importance of this issue, and 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 I, and I believe we're going to see a lot of change in the next um, in the next year, and I can report back too. So that would be, yeah, mm -hmm. that would be great. Okay, uh, this concludes CIDCI's online salon. This session will be recorded and placed on the CIDCI website as soon as possible. To join us for future web rep webinars, be sure to subscribe to our newsletter on our website, CIDCI.org. On March 11th at 8 a.m., join us. Uh, we're going to be in conversation with Armstrong Ceiling and Walls Innovation Director Stephen Wilkinson, uh, who's going to be talking with board member Sig Rubel about the challenges developing a revolutionary new product. What innovation lessons can the design and construction industry learn from product development? Special thanks to Monica Zwistler for keeping us on track, and most especially to Sharon and her team at Grace Farms, Michelle and Elizabeth, for their exceptional report, call to action, um, and for keeping, for keeping us always focused on the humanitarian aspects of our work. Thank you all for joining us. And as always, if you've got thoughts or comments, please reach us on the CIDCI website. Sharon, Elizabeth, Michelle, thank you so much for your time. We look forward to hearing back from you about more success in this really so difficult issue. Thank you so much. Right. It matters a lot. Thank you. <laughs>